The phone rings in the home of Jessica Reyes. A port agent for a Chinese fishing company tells her she's needed at one of the local hospitals to translate for an Indonesian deckhand. The port agent describes the problem as a stomach ache. This wasn't the first time Reyes had been hired to interpret for a crew member in distress. As Montevideo has become a regular stop for Chinese fishing boats, she has received hundreds of similar calls. Most of the deckhands on Chinese fishing boats are Indonesians, and she is the only Bahasa-capable interpreter in the city. At the hospital, Reyes found a young man named Daniel Ertenang. He was in his early 20s, lying on a gurney in the ambulance bay. He whispered to her that he'd been beaten and tied by the neck that he hadn't eaten in weeks. Daniel's limbs and face were grotesquely swollen. His eyes were black and he had bruises on his neck and torso. As Reyes was sent out of the hospital room to wait in the hall, Daniel, crying and shaking, asked her, please, where are my friends? I'm scared. The youngest of three brothers, Daniel grew up on the Indonesian island of Sumatra. As a teenager, he spent his free time working on motorcycles in the shop his father ran next to the family home, rebuilding engines and patching tires, slipping away sometimes with friends to drag race his small blue Yamaha King of the Street motorcycle. His teachers described him as punctual, earnest, a tidy dresser, and a class clown who liked to flirtatiously prank the girls in his class. Orangnya kalau Daniel tu, ini gimana? Senang senang, ceria. Ceria. Iya. agak beda dengan abangnya kalau abangnya karakternya agak-agak apa namanya tuh laki-laki yang agak keras ya tapi dan ini kalem orangnya dan tidak banyak ngomong in may 2018 daniel graduated from high school he applied for jobs at the local mini market and plastic and textile factories but no one was hiring youth unemployment in the village was over 13% Kemudian cari kerja dengan saya, uh-huh. cari kerja ke berbagai perusahaan di Bengkulu. Uh-huh. Ternyata hasilnya nihil, belum dapat. Kalau di darat kan mau skill. Hmm. Yo. Saya ini nggak punya skill. Hmm. Mau, mau ngapa-ngapain nggak bisa. Ya. Terus mau gimana hmm. kalau nggak laut? Many other villagers were returning home from work on foreign fishing ships with enough money to buy motorcycles, land, and their own houses. With no apparent options for finding work in the village, Daniel liked the idea of heading out to sea, as long as he could stay together with his friends. Niat kamu mau ke laut ya sekarang? Iya, saya mau ke laut. Tapi barengan kita jangan sampai pisah. Pisah. Ya udah. Tanggal sekian kita berangkat ke Jawa. Hmm. Kita selesai. In the first week of July of that year, 
Daniel set out with his friend Hanky for Tigal, a city in central Java, to apply for work through a manning agency that recruits and supplies workers to foreign fishing ships. The two young men took medical exams and handed over their passports, copies of their birth certificates and bank documents, along with several headshots. For the next two months, Daniel waited in Tigal to hear if he and Hanky would get a ship assignment. Money ran short. On September 1st, the Manning Agency told Daniel and Hanky to fly to Busan, South Korea where they assumed they would be working on a South Korean vessel. But when they got to the port, they were told to climb aboard a Chinese vessel, a red and white squid jigger called the Zen Fa 7. The Manning Agency had the young men sign a two-year contract. It took roughly three months for the Zen Fa 7 to travel the 8,000 miles to the high seas fishing grounds west of the Galapagos Islands. On board were 20 Chinese crew and eight other Indonesians. Daniel couldn't have known it at the time, but by becoming a crew member on a Chinese squid fishing vessel, he had just stepped onto the lowest rung of what may be the largest maritime operation the world has ever known. And on the Zen Fa 7, Daniel and his friends had entered a world of neglect and violence, one in which they would be captives with little to no hope for escape. Intinya, sangat tidak dikasih apa-apa dikekang di kandang seperti di penjara posisi di kapal itu The officers on the ship all of whom were Chinese were especially rough with the Indonesian deckhands The bosun or deck boss slapped or punched the Indonesians for mistakes slights or slowness Kerja sama orang Cina itu sangat-sangat buruk lah tidak bisa diulangi lagi ini ya kasar sekali kalau kita kalau main tangan sering mandor ya nih ya anak kok hmm. orang Indonesia kan nggak punya harga diri lah kita kayak gitu kan dipegang kepala kita selama satu tahun itu dikasih air minum yang kotor sedangkan orang Cinanya sendiri dapat jatahan air-air bersih yang layak diminum sedangkan orang Indonesia itu Selama satu tahun di situ itu minumnya air kotor terus. For rations, the Zen Fa 7's deckhands were given two boxes of instant noodles per week. Additional snacks, coffee, and cigarettes were deducted from their paychecks. Ya, supermi itu itu kan jatah bu. Kalau kebutuhan lain seperti rokok ataupun kopi, snack segala macam uh-huh. itu kan masuk bon. Oh, kita beli sebenarnya. Ya, oh. Jatah, kalau dengan jatah. Chinese crew members were occasionally allowed to use the satellite phone on the ship's bridge to make calls. But when Daniel and the other Indonesians asked to call home, the captain refused. Daniel's family would go over a year before hearing anything from him. Yang saya rasakan paling sulit itu menghubungi keluarga posisi itu. Rasanya sangat sulit sekali untuk menghubungi keluarga karena Saya tidak dikasih wifi, tidak dikasih telepon sama kapten. Gak bakal lebih enak dari orang Cina. Orang Cina situ naik ke atas telepon. Tahu kami tu di jalan telepon itu. On New Year's Day 2021, 16 months after setting sail from Busan. The Zen Fa 7 
headed from Chile eastward around the southern tip of South America, towards rich fishing grounds near the Falkland Islands, in an area known as the Blue Hole. While passing through the Strait of Magellan, the ship stopped briefly in Chilean waters near Punta Arenas, several hundred yards from shore, close enough to make a cell phone call. Daniel ran below deck, gathering up cigarettes and snacks, and then quickly making the rounds, begging other deckhands to buy them. Daniel and Hanky agreed to split the five minutes to call their families. Daniel dialed his parents' house, where his mother answered. The truth was that Daniel's father, Joni, had died from a heart attack just days earlier. But Daniel's mother thought the news would upset him too much, with him being so far from home. He would never learn the truth of his father's passing, because just a few weeks after making the call home, Daniel fell severely ill. Daniel sakit perut. Gitu dia bilangnya. Ya. Okay. Sakit perut dikasih obat. Mm-hmm. Kasih obat dari atas. Yang sakit di kapal itu Heri Kusmanto dengan Daniel sampai bengkak-bengkak dan menjadi matanya kuning itu. Pertama, Daniel sakit. Hmm. Sebelum kita jaga kan belum terlalu drop. Hmm. Masih punya tenaga sih yeah. dan masih gagah. Hmm. For weeks, as Daniel's condition slowly deteriorated, the other Indonesians on board pleaded with the captain to allow Daniel to get onshore medical attention. But the captain refused to leave the fishing grounds. Setelah satu bulan berjalan, kondisi semakin drop. Nah, di situ lah. Gimana caranya nih? Dan pas di Argentina sudah parah, kita berontak sama kapten untuk memulangkan Daniel orang Indonesia semua orang Indonesia ngomong sama itu yeah. kalau sampai enggak kami enggak mau kerja lagi mau pulang semua mm. the captain finally acquiesced on March 2nd transferring Daniel to a nearby fuel tanker called the Marlin which agreed to carry him to Montevideo hati-hati saya bilang saya pegang pundaknya mm. hati-hati nih kamu di sana mudah-mudahan enggak lama sehat jadi aku bisa pulang mm. Mm. Daniel was transferred from the Zenfa 7 to the fuel tanker Marlin on March 2nd and he arrived in Montevideo six days later, on March 8th. And rather than carrying Daniel all the way to shore, the Marlin crew put him in a skiff and dumped him on the port before motoring away. Just over two hours after arriving at the hospital, Daniel Eritonong died Daniel most likely died from a form of acute malnutrition known as beriberi, caused by a lack of vitamin B1, also known as thiamine. Experts say that allowing workers on fishing ships to contract and die from beriberi constitutes criminal neglect, because the disease is so easily prevented through proper nutrition or vitamin pills and can be treated when it occurs. Daniel's body was flown from Montevideo to Jakarta on April 22nd. 
the next day, it was driven by ambulance to his family home in Benkulu, where a crowd of villagers lined the road to pay their respects. Saya tanyakan, maksud saya gimana kap yang ini kap masalah Daniel di darat, sudah saya hal tu boleh dibawa pulang. Ya kaptennya gitu gitulah bok, kayak menghindar istilahnya. Terus ngomong-ngomong apa-apa masalah Indonesia gimana hidup di sana kan. For over three months, the captain of the Zenfa Seven kept Daniel's death a secret from Hanky and the other Indonesian deckhands as they continued their fishing operations. It wasn't until after they had disembarked from the Zenfa 7 on July 2nd that they learned of Daniel's fate. Baru tahu kami itu. Dari teman kapal sebelah kami. Di kami di kapal itu ada tahu, sekira kami sehat, pulang. Nah, di situlah kami tahu Daniel udah enggak ada lagi di Singapura. By the time Hanky and the other Indonesian deckhands had made it home, Daniel's body had long been buried in the village cemetery, laid to rest just a few feet from his father, his grave marker bearing the last name of his mother. Berangkat, ya, niat kan mau berangkat dari sini kan, mau bantuin orang tua. Ya. Yeah. Tujuan kami mau gitu. Hmm. Terus sampai di sana, Ntar kalau pulang, uangnya kamu mau ngapain, hmm. uang mau kamu taruh di mana, atau mau kamu bikin apa kan, hmm. sharing lah istilahnya, hmm. cerita. Yeah. Saya bilang, saya mau gini, kalau punya uang ntar mau gini, ya ya udah hmm. kamu gimana Nel? Dibilang ada Nel, saya mau bikin ini usaha, usaha. atau kan mau bikin rumah kan segala macam lah. Hmm. Kan. Usahanya. Daniel's family signed a non-disclosure agreement with the Chinese fishing company. In exchange for releasing the company from wrongdoing, they received the equivalent of about $13,000, money they ended up using to repair their roof. Daniel managed to fix up his parents' house after all. Thank you.